morning, everyone. Uh, we gather once again, live stream on YouTube, and it's great to see people joining the service and commenting. Please do remember to comment. Uh, shout out to Sue, who's joined us. Philip, not sure who JRT401 is, but uh, they say hello. Uh, Jason's with us, Sel's with us, Jessica, Ian, uh, Way is with us, Way and Ron, and the Lees. And uh, reminding us that the kids, uh, it's the last week for the kids Zoom. So uh, the kids will be joining this week because of course, this way, because of course next week uh, some will be joining us back here. We'll be alternating our children's services. More about that later in the service. But please do remember to comment and it's great to be able to connect with each other this way. This is a special service this morning. We are praying for families. I think we're all aware of uh, the way that God has put us in families and the importance of families, how when families work well, individuals work well, society works well, when they fall apart, we uh, need to pray. And so uh, we'll be praying for families this morning. If you have joined us, we've been advertising this on social media, so if you have joined us as a guest here today, you are most welcome. It's great to have you with us and uh, we'll be inviting you later to join with us in prayer and uh, to connect with us through our website. So, a uh, special morning. Uh, and we have with us this morning guest speaker, Stephen Dining. Did I pronounce that? St Denning, I beg your pardon. Stephen Denning, should have got that right before the service, uh, who's from Anglicare, and he'll be giving us the message this morning, so we'll find out a bit more about Stephen in a moment. Uh, Remember that uh, we pray to God because he created families. And we read in Ephesians chapter 3, I kneel, uh, the Apostle Paul said, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Our Father in heaven is the source of the ideas of us gathering together in families. He created us to be in families and so we pray to him this morning. As we start, begin this morning, we're going to reflect on this song, How Great Thou Art, where the words will uh, come into our hearts. Then sings my soul, my Father God to thee, how great thou art. Please listen to this song now. <laughs> I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. shall come 
with shouts of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then shall I bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my Tim and Naomi, welcome. Great to have you with us this morning. Thank you. Great to be here and with you. Yes, there and here. And uh, we're looking forward to you being physically here with us in Malabar next year. And I think uh, 16th of January is your first Sunday with us. So we are um, praying and looking forward to that. But we thought this would be a good opportunity to get to know you better. So firstly, the big question, how did you come to know Christ? Um, well, for, for me personally, um, God's, uh, God has been very kind and he uh, put me in a family where my parents taught me about the Bible and uh, Jesus and trusting in him for salvation, uh, took me on to church each week. Uh, so I've, I've known the gospel uh, to some degree for my whole life. Uh, but I think there was a real uh, moment when I was at university and seeing uh, the necessity to understand that God's word is uh, how we hear God's voice and how we um, yeah, know what he's like uh, and the authority that the scriptures have uh, in all facets of life. Uh, and so learning and growing to, to trust in what God's word says, um, yeah, that, that was a really sort of pivotal time for me at university. Uh, and I really enjoyed really digging into the scriptures, which is one of the reasons why I like teaching people the Bible, for example, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Right. So That's your me. parents your parents were very influential, but university was a very important time for you to discover mm. Christ for yourself and to grow in your knowledge of him. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. What about yourself, Naomi? Yeah, quite similar. Uh, I grew up in a family who taught me about Jesus and I was able to read the Bible and uh, learnt lots of Bible stories as I was growing up. Uh, but there was definitely um, some stepping stones along the way that was helpful for me to grasp what it really means uh, to be a Christian, to live with Jesus as my saviour and Lord. Uh, but it was definitely um, a one of the big turning points for me to grapple with the truth of who Jesus is was actually understanding that the Bible was one big story. Uh, I think I learnt lots of stories but never really saw how they fit together. And when I started realising that, uh, Jesus just seemed so much more highlighted to me of why he came to earth, how important he is, and that, yeah, he, he was the one that everything was pointing to. And so yeah. that just made, for me, um, the importance of Jesus so much more, um, yeah, uh, valuable in my life to live for him. So it sounds like uh, you learnt a new way to read the Bible, which uh, helps you to know Christ in a new way. Um, mm. I, I think you told me that you were homeschooled, Naomi, is that right? What was that yes, experience yeah. like? Why did your parents choose to homeschool you? Yeah, well, it was kind of more of a, a practical uh, yeah, help for my mum because my mum was a teacher in a school that I was attending at the time. And uh, she uh, fell pregnant with my younger sister. And so she heard about homeschooling and thought, great, that just makes things a bit easier. Um, so, yeah, me and my siblings gave it a go of doing some homeschooling. And, yeah, it was a great experience. Um, but even looking back at that, I think there's, there's lots of pros and cons for both homeschooling and schooling. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I lean towards either one at the moment, but, uh, yeah. It was a good experience. 
Yeah, it's up to the siblings to um, steal your lunch money and kick you in the shins, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And what about each other? How did you come to know each other? Um, well, the two of us had been going to uh, a, our old church uh, together. There was an evening service at uh, in Wallandilly Anglican Church, so southwest of Sydney, which is where we grew up. Um, we were both involved in a number of ministries at the church there, uh, music and youth and the, the Sunday service in leading and that sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, we developed a really good and close friendship and enjoyed working alongside each other and I suppose, I don't know, kind of naturally flowed into, oh, actually, I really like you. <laughs> so maybe let's, uh, yeah, you know, pursue a relationship, see how that goes. Um, yeah, and after a year of dating, we were married. Mm. So we, yeah. we did know each other for quite a while mm. as friends. Okay. Friend. So there was a longer dating process. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> Naomi, next, next year you'll be coming on as our ch children's ministry director. And uh, Tim, you'll be coming on as a student minister at our church. So uh, I hope you're looking forward to that. What are you looking forward to in joining St. Mark's? Yeah, uh, I'm greatly looking forward to being able to um, be encouraging young children to be trusting in Jesus. Uh, it's um, been something that uh, I really love to do, but unfortunately I haven't been able to do that much the last few years. And I was able to do it in my um, original old church. Uh, but, yeah, the last few years have been more focusing on uh, uni students. And so, yeah, keen to jump into uh, teaching God's word to young children, which is great. It's exciting and um, a chance to be creative and fun. Uh, but um, also I think I'm really, like, really keen to um, be part of a church that, uh, has lots of different nationalities and um, to be learning from each other and uh, experiencing yeah different ways of life. Um, so yeah, that's that's two things I'm really excited about. Mm. Perfect. It's the same. Yeah. Yeah. For me, much similar to what Naomi has already said. Uh, I think it's just exciting to be going to a, a church that's different, perhaps the, to what we're used to. Uh, even uh, like living and churching in Sydney, which is something we haven't done before. Uh, currently in Wollongong. Yeah, some similarities, but quite different. Um, yeah, and getting to know some of our family, I suppose, that we haven't met yet, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ and right. yeah. uh, loving and serving Jesus alongside um, the saints at Malabar. Well, we're looking forward to you joining us. You're about to go through a season of lots of changes and moving and things like that. What can we be praying for? Mm, I think that's probably the main one is Move. all the change is happening yep yes. um so and and we'll be saying goodbye to a lot of good things in Wollongong mm. uh, some really good friendships and relationships uh in work and ministry and life uh that we've made over the past couple of years living here uh saying goodbye to our current church Wollongong Baptist Church I think that'll be hard to do um and and hard to to leave the area uh so prayer for um yeah, a good good transition. We certainly will be doing that. Um, mm. Naomi, you'll bring us the Bible reading for today. Would you mind opening the scriptures for us? Yeah, I would love to. Thank you. So we're reading from Luke chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Now jumping down to verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off, for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a famine in the land, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out 
to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For well, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came the, near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat, so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, he kills the fattened calf, sorry, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Uh, we'll be celebrating your arrival here at St. Mark's, although we won't be killing a fattened calf, but uh, <laughs> we'll do other things uh, to welcome you and, and to celebrate with you. So uh, go well, uh, God bless, and we'll see you soon. Well, it's lovely to see Tim and Naomi and I'm sure that you will welcome them when they join us next year. And we're excited about their arrival. Uh, we have here with us this morning Stephen. Stephen's also from the Wollongong area. And Stephen is our guest speaker this morning. Thank you for being here, Stephen. Thanks for having me, Gavin. And thanks for having me in your lounge rooms or wherever you're watching right now. <laughs> it's, it's weird, isn't it? It's very yeah, weird. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, rem reminding you, this is live. Uh, or at least with a 20-second delay. Oh, yes. um, and uh, Stephen, you um, work with families, but not only do you research that and work with families, you experience it yourself. Yes, I'm part you, of family, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so tell us about your family. Okay, well, I've uh, got some slides so I can introduce you to my family. So you see there my wife, Anne, and then next to her is Jessica, and next to me is Rebecca. This was at Jessica's 18th birthday party, uh, two years ago, so we now have a daughter in her emerging adult years and Rebecca is has just turned 17, so we're entering a kind of straddling the teenage phase and then the young adult phase. Uh, in terms of then wider family, as you can see, it's a big family. I'm one of five siblings. Uh, this was taken at nie one of our niece's weddings last year in Darwin. Uh, so I think we're oh, up nice. around 25 people now across three generations. Wonderful. 
And then this is my wife's family, as you can see, a little smaller. Uh, yes. Take a guess as to what Anne's aunt knitted for us yes. all for Christmas presents that year. For Christmas presents? Yes. Uh, it would be more handy in winter, I'd imagine. Exactly, yes. It was about 35 degrees outside that day, so we <laughs> donned the beanies for the shot and then nice. we took them straight off. Nice. So that's Anne's side of the family. Yes, uh, very good. Um, and tell us how you witnessed to Christ at, at home. Yeah, so Anne and I have always... Uh, sought to just weave witness to Christ through what we do as a family. So, you know, that passage in Deuteronomy 6 where it says, yeah. write the commands on the doorpost, talk about it as you go along. Uh, that's what Anne and I have sought to do with varying degrees of success <laughs> and or otherwise. And we just sought to make it, to weave it into our family life, formally and informally. Mm. Right. Yeah, and I think... Um the kids want to see that your faith in Christ is real uh, yeah. and not just when you preach and you know you, you put on your performance so much but in your everyday life. Yeah. Exactly, yes, yeah. yeah. I was commenting to a friend the other day, I mean, parenting the way God's wired is 90% imitation, yes. which is incredibly efficient and incredibly scary. But certainly... <laughs> right. as, as we Including when you drive. Except <laughs> when we drive, yeah. So Anne and I certainly, uh, as flawed as we are, seek to show the, the grace and mercy Christ has showed us. We seek to... Sh- show that to our girls, but also the beauty of a number of our family members are Christian as well, so we, it's across the extended family they mm. get to see Christ. Right. Lovely. Um, and tell us about your work. Yeah, so I work for Anglicare. I've um, got the team shirt on today. Um, family and life skills education team. So our team partners with churches uh, to, we say, uh, give knowledge and skills for doing life better across a range of different areas. So my area of focus is family life, parenting, marriage, but also just getting on with people. How can we get on with each other well? How can we function well together? So I run uh, courses, seminars along those lines and also then involved in one-on-one counselling at the Wollongong site as well. Right. It sounds busy. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, good mix of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what would be a piece of advice that you would give to families, just generally? Yeah, look, I think it's God has wide at the heart of family life is relationships. Uh, so our relationship with our Heavenly Father sets the, the, the template for then loving him enables us to love each other. So certainly for parenting, when you think of the, the influence we have in our kids' lives from when they're conceived up to, you know, kind of late teens, early 20s, work, continue to work on your relationship with our kids. Because it's, it's out of the relationship that everything in parenting flows. Our instruction of our kids, our training, our teaching, our nurturing, our um, authority as parents comes from the relationship we have with them. So keep working on our relationships. Right. Yeah. Don't let them die. No, exactly. Yeah. Yep. All right. I'm going to step down now okay. and leave it to you to first pray and then to bring us the message. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for Kevin. being here, Stephen. Okay, friends, let me uh, lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to look at your word now, we ask that by your spirit it would uh, come alive to us. It would speak to us exactly where we need to be spoken to today. And that through this, you would uh, continue to make us all um, more the most Christ-like family members that we can be. Amen. So as we um, begin today, I want you to think of all the different Uh, way, all the different types of relationships you have in your family life. Because often I think, particularly in church context, when we talk about families, we often automatically go to kind of husband and wife and kids and particularly younger kids. But as my photo showed, we are connected in a a wide range of family relationships. So I'm sure you could show me photos of your immediate family and extended family in which you could be like me, I'm a son, I'm a father, I'm a husband, um, I was a grandson, my grandparents had died, I'm an aunt, I'm an uncle, I'm an in-law, um, I'm a cousin. We have all sorts of different uh, connections and relationships in our family life. So as we go through today, I want you to think of that, that wider family focus. But also, I mentioned, like me, did you notice that the photos I showed you were photos of celebration, photos of good times, of uh, meaningful occasions of precious memories? And I imagine that it's the type of photos we put on social media, if we're on social media. But of course, there are a range of other photos that we don't put on social media that we don't show people, uh, primarily because we probably don't have photos of these occasions. 
This is the, the, the fights and frustrations of family life or the, the dashed hopes and disappointments. These are the relationships that are, that are busted up or they're fractured. It's, it's the chaos and confusion that we can experience in family life. We don't post photos of these things. But those kind of two sorts of photos we have of family life, in a way, bring out the dilemma of family life. As Gavin alluded to at the start, we know just families are so important for our, for our functioning in life. Families can be wonderful places where we learn about life, we learn about relationships, we receive comfort and support, and, and the influence of our families goes on well after family members have died. But on the other hand, we all know the, the, the difficulty and complexity of family life, the depth of pain, the depth of hurt, our damage done to us by other family members can influence our whole lives. And long after that family member has died. And the reality is it's not an either or of these experiences. It's, it's a both end. It's a mixture of these experiences. So in thinking about the theme today, praying for families and how, um, what we could possibly look at in about 20 minutes together, I decided to, to focus on this question, which comes up on the screen, is how can we come home? How can we come home in family life? That is, when the relationships in our families, whether our immediate family or our extended family, when they're not all that they should be or they can be or they need to be, how can we come home? That is, when those family relationships are busted up in some way or cut off or people have even said, you're dead to me, and yet when we experience some sort of repair, some sort of re reunion, and especially some form of um, reconciliation in these family lives where those, those emoji faces change to then the joy, uh, the comfort, the, just the relief of family life being back together, it's like we've come home. So how can we come home in family life? What I'd like to do is, is to, be, to, to begin to answer this question. I can't give a full answer. But to start to answer this question from the story we heard from Jesus in Luke chapter 15, the story of a father and two sons. And to give you the, kind of the nutshell is where we're heading. What I want us to understand is that being welcomed home by a heavenly father into God's family enables us to welcome each other home when our family relationships aren't all that they can be or should be or need to be. Being welcomed home by a heavenly father into God's family, that enables us to welcome home each other when our family relationships aren't all that they can be, they need to be and should be. So that's where we're going to head and we'll, we'll do it by uh, jumping into the story from Luke chapter 15. Now, uh, I'd imagine many of us are, are probably familiar with this story. It's often called the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son. And if you're not familiar with the story, you've probably heard the phrase, the, the prodigal son or the prodigal. It gets used quite a lot in our everyday speech. And, and sometimes if we're, when we're familiar with the story from the Bible, sometimes we can miss the depth of it. So what I want to, I'm going to take us through four words that help us get into the depth of this story, the depth of what's going on in, this, in these relationships between the father and the two sons. And the four words are dead, shame, alive, and self-righteous. So let's... Uh, the younger son is in essence saying to his father, Dad, I can't wait for my inheritance. Um, I want it now. I wish you were dead. And then sometime after, when he gets, he gets the money, he then leaves home. And this is not just a physical leaving home, it's a relational leaving home. Father, I've got what I want. Uh, I'm out of here. You're dead to me. I'm leaving. Now, at this point, Jesus doesn't uh, let us into what's going on, on the father's response to this. But I don't think it takes too much imagination for us to... Uh, kind of feel the blade that must have gone through the father's heart. 
Because I, I can imagine that there's, there's those of us who would have experienced a relationship with a family member, whether it's you know, a parent and an adult child or sibling or whether it's a, uh, with a, a grandparent or a spouse, where in some way they've, they've cut you off. They've, they've put a block on that relationship. And, and in the worst case scenario, they say, you're dead to me. Where we've been in those situations, we know the, the blade through our heart that is. We can get a sense of what it's like for this father. But secondly, shame. You see, the son leaves home, he goes off wild living, and then he squanders all the inheritance he has, and then a famine hits. And then he's desperate and destitute, and the only job he can get is feeding pigs. Now, remember, this is a Jewish story. Uh, and, and from the Old Testament, uh, Jews weren't to associate with pigs, with pork, with ham, with bacon. And yet here is this son in the pig trough feeding the pigs. He can't get any lower. He's hit rock bottom. His selfish, self-centred attitudes and actions have led to hitting rock bottom. Now, I can imagine it's not very hard to kind of tap into the shame the son must be feeling at this rock bottom. Now, if we're from an Anglo-Western culture, such as I am, I think we can probably, uh, with, with its individual focus, we can readily tap into the shame the son uh, can be feeling for his actions. And perhaps uh, you can identify with that sense of your actions and attitudes and the, and the fallout of these on your family members. You feel great shame at this. But if we're from a Middle, Middle Eastern culture of Jesus' time or, say, Asian cultures where it's a much more collective focus, it's a much more whole family focus, we can probably tune into the, the shame that has come across his whole family. We can perhaps identify ourselves where actions and our attitudes have led to courses of action that's brought shame on our whole family. Now, whether the individual focus or the collective focus, this shame is a major barrier to going home. We can imagine from the individual focus, the son feels, I'm so ashamed, I can't go home. Or from the collective focus, the son can be feeling, I've brought such shame on my whole family. They could never welcome me home. What the, father, what the son does, he then comes to his senses and says, okay, I'm going to go home, I'm going to try and go home, and I'm going to prepare this speech where I, I acknowledge my guilt between my uh, earthly father and my heavenly father, and I'm going to come up with a plan for dad to welcome me home, even though I've caused such shame. I'm going to say, Dad, don't take me back as a son. Take me back as a servant. So the son sets off home. This brings us to our third word, alive. Well, as we heard in the story, the son doesn't get a chance to say his full speech. Because while he's been away, his dad has been on the veranda, gazing at the horizon, longing to see his dead son coming towards home. And on this day, he looks out and that's exactly what he sees. So filled with compassion, he charges off down the street to his son. Now, fatherly dignified Middle Eastern men didn't, in Jesus' day, pick up their robes, put it between their legs and charge off down the street. They probably don't do it now either. It was very undignified. But this father at this point doesn't worry about social niceties. He sees his son, his compassion wells up, so he charges down the street to his son, not to condemn him, but to embrace him, to kiss him, to hug him, to say, welcome home, and then to throw a huge party to welcome him home for this, because this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He is lost and now he's found. My son is alive. My relationship with him is alive again. Can you identify with the father? Whether you're a father or a mother or a grandparent or a husband or wife, but, but you've had a family member who's somehow cut off from you. And even they've said to you, you're dead to me. 
But like the father, uh, you've scanned the horizon longing to see them heading back home. And then you get the text or the phone call or the email or they drop in unexpectedly. And your compassion is kindled. You embrace, you hug, you kiss, you say, welcome home. And you want to throw a huge party because that family member is alive to you again. Your relationship with them is alive again. You want to throw a party. Well, not everyone in the story wanted to join the party. As we heard with the elder son, and this takes us to our fourth word, self-righteous. The elder son has a dummy spit and throws a tantrum when he hears the party. The reason for the party is that son. So he confronts his father in an angry, self-righteous tirade. You know, I've slaved you all these years. I've never once disobeyed you. I couldn't even get a goat from you. And here's that son of yours. Notice he can't call him my brother. That son of yours squanders everything and you give him the fatted calf. Well, the father, for, on his part, ignores the son's self-righteousness and even the unfair allegations. And he urges him to join the party, again stating the cause for such celebration. But we had to celebrate and be glad. This brother of yours, this your brother, was dead, he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And the father urges his older son to come and join the party. Well, the story ends with the son standing outside outside the party, outside the family home, deciding whether to join. Have you ever found yourself, literally or figuratively, standing outside the party? Standing outside your family home, especially when there's been a repair, a reunion, a reconciliation of some kind, and you say, how can that family member be welcomed home after what they've done? Perhaps you're standing outside the party now, today. Well, that's, that's the story. It's simple, there's, but there's so much more to be said because it's an incredibly profound story. And it's a demonstration of Jesus' mastery as a storyteller. Now, you recall at the start, I said that this, this story begins to answer for us how we can come home. Um, And and again, here is the answer in a nutshell. Being welcomed home by a heavenly father into God's family enables us, by God's spirit, to welcome each other home when our family relationships aren't all they can or need to be. So let me just walk through this in a bit more detail to explain for us. So first off, first and foremost... We all need to come home to God's family. That's the primary relationship for life. Because the youngest son isn't just an example of an earthly son who's who's cut off from his earthly father. The youngest son is a picture for for all of us uh, to understand in relation to our heavenly father. As Naomi said before in the interview, um, she came to understand the bigger story of the Bible. And the big story of the Bible is we were to understand that each of us are sons and daughters of God, created by God to be in relationship with him. But each one of us kind of in our own ways have said to God, oh God, you're dead to me. This can look all sorts of different ways. You're dead to me can be just blind indifference to God's existence. Your dead to me could be just ingratitude that we don't recognise. Every breath we have, everything good we enjoy comes from the Heavenly Father's hands. Your dead to me can be a sense of just uh, like God, just active rebellion. I'm not going to love what you love. The Bible is clear that, that all of us are in this position, yet at some point, when we, if we come to our senses whether we hit rock bottom or we sense there's a hole in our lives that only God can fill or we recognise our ingratitude or we just get a sense that, look, there's got to be more to life than how I'm living it. 
when we come to our senses like that, like the young, younger son did, we can then stop, turn around and head for home like the son did. The Bible's words for this is repentance, where we stop. We say, what have I been doing? We turn around and walk towards home. We walk back to God. And it's, and it's like the son, we acknowledge that, God, I, I just haven't lived life with you at the centre. I've lived as if you're dead to me. But from now on, I don't want to do that. I want to live in relationship with you. I want you to be my relationship with you to to influence everything I do. What you love, I want to love. How you want me to live, that's the way I want to live. And when we come home like that, the compassion of the Heavenly Father was like the compassion of the Father in the story. God is scanning the horizon looking for lost sons and daughters to return home. And when he sees one, he runs out to greet them, to embrace them, to kiss them, to say, welcome home, I want to throw a party. For my daughter who was dead is alive again. She was lost and now she's found. For my son who was dead is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And this welcome home that our father gives us brings us into his family. Jesus is our, becomes our Lord and Saviour and brother. And then the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives to transform how we live. And God's welcome home into his family can overcome whatever shame is there for us. Shame of what our own actions and attitudes have done and the impact on our family members Shame about what our actions and attitudes have done for our whole family. Shame of of what our actions have done to God and his family. And we can have, have the guarantee of this because we see the cost the Heavenly Father was prepared to pay to welcome us home. Did you notice in the story the Father paid not just for the cost of the party, the Father paid for the cost of the Son saying, you're dead to me. That was out of the father's estate. He paid the cost to cover the actions of the son. And with our heavenly father and and Jesus Christ, we see the cost they were willing to pay so we could be welcomed home back into God's family. Jesus' death on the cross paid the cost for our failure to love God, our failure to love others, including our family members. So I suppose the question I want to ask you today, do you need to come home? First and foremost, do you need to come home to your Heavenly Father? Perhaps for the first time. Or perhaps you did in the past and you recognise you've wandered from home and need to return home. Well, when I finish up shortly, I'll be praying a prayer and asking you to join me in that. But before I, I, I do, I just want to touch on that how being in part of God's family, being welcomed home by God, enables us to welcome each other home when our relationships aren't all that they can be, should be and need to be. Because living as a member of God's family helps us be the Christ-like family members in our own family. So I'm just going to sketch these very briefly to... Uh, help you think about this and what it looks like in your own family life. So firstly, a repentance and change lifestyle is needed for coming home. So when we've wronged family members, when we've caused hurt and harm, we need to repent. Repent to God, repent to family members, and then exhibit a changed lifestyle in our actions and attitudes to help heal uh, that relationship. So Peter was a man in his 40s. He was walking with God, but then for 13 years he turned away from God. He had his a wife and young kids, and in this time he grew distant from them. In his early 40s, he, he has an asthma attack. He's in hospital. The doctors say to his wife, Helen, we don't think he's going to make the night. 
Uh, Peter was in his, his hospital bed, recognised the gravity of the situation and prayed to God. Okay, God, he hadn't prayed for a while, but okay, God, if this is it, okay, I surrender. This is it. But it was like God said to him, I haven't finished with you yet. And God gave Peter back his life. And so Peter then recommitted his life to God. Part of that included rebuilding the relationships that he'd separated himself from in his family. But this was no quick process. It took time. Over time, he healed the relationship with his mum and his siblings. And over time, he healed the relationship with his wife and his kids. And Peter said, the peace I had with my heavenly father helped me then work at the separations, rebuilding my relationships with my family members. So repentance uh, and changed lifestyle is needed when we return home. But secondly, uh, longing for the loved one to come home. The flip side for Peter was his, was his wife, Helen. Those 13 years for Helen, she said, were incredibly lonely years. Peter was away from home a lot, uh, physically, but also emotionally. And also spiritually, she was seeking to raise the children in the Lord by herself. She was seeking her, her own Christian life she had to do in isolation from Peter. It was like she was on the horizon watching Peter, uh, longing for him to come home. And she said what kept her going was prayer, was the support of other Christian women at church, and trying to be as faithful witness as she could. It can be lonely and painful amongst other things where we're longing for a family member to come home. To help us be patient, I think, can be helpful to tap in to what it's like for our Heavenly Father as he longs and waits for his children to come home. Ask our Heavenly Father to give us what we need to wait patiently, to pray dependently. Number three, forgiveness is a process, not a moment. A general rule of thumb is that the deeper the hurt, the longer it takes in the process of forgiveness. Um, when we need to forgive someone, it's not easy. It's not cheap. And the person who's, done, who's in the wrong can't demand forgiveness. They can ask for it. So we given how hard it is to forgive people at times, and it's a process, we need to ask the Lord Jesus by his spirit to give us what we need to do those steps in forgiving. Step by step, what does it take to help me to welcome this person home? And then the kind of foundation for this is, is recognising the forgiveness we've received through Christ. But it is a process it's not a moment. So we need to continually ask the Lord Jesus to give us what we need to do it step by step. And finally, a self-righteous warning. While the younger son was unattractive in his selfishness and greed, the older son was equally unattractive in his self-righteousness. Indeed, Jesus told the story uh, to tap into tax to Pharisees and teachers of the law who were saying that Jesus shouldn't associate with, with people like tax collectors and sinners because they shouldn't be in God's family. And Jesus is saying, no, the Heavenly Father is willing to welcome anyone home who returns to him. So yes, family life can be complex and messy and complicated. But we do need to be on our guard against any sense of self-righteousness that inhibits our actions, our attitudes in welcoming family members home, in seeking to repair and reconcile where our relationships aren't all they can and need and should, should be. And so again, we keep coming back to the Lord Jesus. Because if he was self-righteous, which he had every um, entitlement to be self-righteous, but he wasn't. And he was willing to go to the cross to pay the price for us who would cost the Heavenly Father and, and his Son so dearly. So if Jesus was not willing to be self-righteous, that's our model. That's our, uh, who we need to turn to to help us not be self-righteous. 
So I want to conclude by um, leading a prayer for those of you who feel you, you need to come home. You need to come home to God. Whether for the first time or like Peter, you've been wandering. But you're hearing God's call, you're heeding God's call, you want to turn home. I'm going to lead us in prayer now. And if this is your prayer, you could uh, pray it along with me wherever you're listening. The Heavenly Father, I want to come home. I realise I'm lost. I realise I've lost my way. And in some way, shape or form, I've said you're dead to me. But I want to come home. I want to receive your welcome. From now on, I want to love what you love. I want to live the way you want me to live. I want to live right with you so I can live right with those people in my family, those people that you've, you've given me that are so influential for all of life. And I ask that uh, by your spirit you would help me to do this, uh, knowing that through the Lord Jesus I can be now part of your family. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. I wonder if you could bring me the clipper. Uh, the, sorry, the clicker. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that message. And uh, if you are visiting us today, and if you have thought to yourself, I want to be welcomed home by the Father, I want to have my relationship restored with him, and if you have prayed that prayer, maybe for the first time, maybe it was a type of prayer that you prayed many years ago, and you've renewed your commitment to the Lord, then please contact us. We'd love to talk to you. We know that there are guests watching today, and uh, this has been this is a service for you, not just to pray for your families, but to help you to understand the invitation that the Father gives to be called into his family. Uh, our contact details on our website, so uh, you'll find them there. Please uh, contact us. It's confidential, of course. Just say uh, something like, Gavin, I'd love to talk to you, and uh, we'll be in contact with you. We're now going to pray for our families. Our families are very important to us, and you were promised prayer. Uh, James writes, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. And so this is not uh, just a, a, an exercise in... Um, bring our needs to our mind, but in speaking to God, because God is powerful, he hears our prayers and he answers them, and our families need his help, his intervention. So uh, firstly, we're going to pray for parents, and uh, we're going to pray for wisdom for parents to raise their children. Proverbs chapter 22 says, start children off, on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they'll not turn from it. So parents have the important task of raising their children and ensuring that they reach their God-given potential. This, however, can be a challenge, and parents need wisdom in doses to do this. So if you are a parent, we invite you to now to pray to our Father in Heaven. If you are a parent, we're going to pray for you now. Loving Father, we pray this morning for our parents. We thank you for the gift of children and we ask for your wisdom and patience to raise them the best way that we can. Help us to love our children and for our parenting to be characterised by gentleness, patience and appropriate discipline. May our households be full of laughter and joy and support and show us what and how to teach our children that they may grow up to honour you and to serve others. We pray for fathers, for the mothers, for grandparents, for aunties and uncles and family friends. May they exercise their God-given responsibilities for the strengthening of the family unit. When children are young, we pray for the laying down of life foundations. When they are teenagers, we pray for growing maturity and that they'll use their freedoms wisely and with responsibility. 
And when they are adults, we ask for ongoing support and love. So, Father, this morning we pray for our parents. We're now going to pray in regard to conflict. This week, uh, Jason Law, our assistant minister, wrote in our newsletter, and I'll quote, Conflicts remain part and parcel of living in the present age, and rather than praying that God will just take them away, we should view conflict as a, a, an opportunity for growth. We know that families are meant to love each other and support each other, but often they're torn apart by conflict. Uh, perhaps you are experiencing conflict in your family environment. Perhaps an initial disagreement has potential to create much hurt and to blow out into full-scale division. You may struggle to see a way out, yet I remind you that this morning we pray to a God who performs miracles. And we invite you now to bring your conflict to the foot of the cross where God dealt with conflict between him and us once for all. And we ask God for healing that is beyond human power. So if you are experiencing conflict in your families, I invite you now to join in prayer. Loving Father, we pray for those who are experiencing conflict that leads to fighting and arguing, misunderstanding and sometimes silence. From difference of opinion, bring understanding. From disagreement, bring unity and tolerance. From sin and abuse, bring repentance. Break down the walls of hostility and restore peace in our families. Use conflict to make us stronger, kinder and wiser. May the offended have the strength to reach out and seek reconciliation. May the perpetrator see the error of their way and seek forgiveness. May your love abound in our families. We're now going to pray for family estrangement. Family estrangement is defined as the loss of previously existing relationships between family members. There may be parents who, for one reason or another, can no longer see their children, or children who can't be with their parents. Families are best together, and there's a feeling of loss and sadness when they can't be. If you are suffering from family estrangement, we invite you to pray to our Father in heaven. His love can never be taken away from us in Christ. So we now pray for family estrangement. If you are going through that, please join us in prayer. Loving Father, there are among us people who are separated from their loved ones. If the situation is partial estrangement, then we pray that the parent will make the most of the limited access that they have. And we pray for opportunities to relate, whether it be through a card, a note, an email, a phone call, or brief time together. Where there is no access at all, we pray that you would watch over and keep children safe when parents can't. Please minister to those who suffer from sadness and disappointment for not being able to see their loved ones. Where possible, through the power of love and forgiveness, bring families back together. We also pray for single parents this morning. A typical family has two parents, but many are forced to raise children on their own. In Australia, 15% of homes have one parent. This can be a lonely existence that robs parents of time, resources and support. And we invite single parents now to pray and to commit your family to the Lord. Loving Father, for those that raise children on their own, we especially pray that you will give them the strength and resource that they need to lead and nurture and provide for their families. Please provide partnerships with other people who can help, whether it be through providing resources, time, love or simple moral support. When the parents feel exhausted, please provide energy and sustenance. When they feel frustrated, provide them with peace. Where they are discouraged, please encourage and uplift. 
We pray that you will honour those who have to do it on their own. We now pray in regard to family and domestic violence. In Australia, one in six women uh, and one in 16 men suffer from violence in their family, usually at the hands of a spouse or partner. Whether it be emotional, spiritual or physical abuse, many live in fear of explosive tempers and overreactions. They need protection, support and safety. Perhaps you are a victim of domestic abuse. Perhaps you are a perpetrator. We invite you now to lift your needs in prayer and lift your situation to the Lord. We pray now for domestic violence. Father, we pray for your protection over those who suffer from domestic and family violence. We pray that victims will know where to find refuge and safety. We pray for courage and wisdom to take evasive action. We pray for perpetrators, that they will be convicted of the damage that they inflict. May they take responsibility for their own actions and seek help. We pray for us as a society that will neither encourage nor condone domestic violence and provide help for victims. We pray for the police, family services and law courts that they would take swift and appropriate action to prevent further injury. We pray for non-judgmental friends who will provide support and advice. And we pray that victims will not suffer on their own. And we also bear, keep in mind those who are single. We now pray for um, single adults, whether it be by choice or simply due to not meeting a partner yet. Singleness can bring struggle, but also opportunity. Singleness can, however, result in loneliness, discontent, financial disadvantage and prejudice. So we invite single people to now join us in prayer. We pray for those who have lost spouses or are yet to have a partner. For those who have resigned to the fact that they'll never marry again, provide them with contentment that comes from knowing your presence and love. For those who are still looking and hoping, we pray that you will lead them to the right person for them. When and if they eventually marry, may they be stronger together than they are as separate individuals. We pray that single people will identify the freedom and opportunity that singleness brings. And we pray that we will all be aware of the single people in our midst and remember to include and care for them. May the single life that the Lord Jesus Christ led be a model for many and may contentment reign in their hearts. And so this morning, Father, we pray for our families. May they be places of love where children are nurtured, people are supported and kindness prevails. We thank you for the gift of families that ensure that we not struggle alone. And we pray, Father, knowing that we're not perfect, knowing that we fail, we pray for forgiveness. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would open our hearts to forgive others, even when they don't ask for forgiveness, and to perhaps reach out to them. And, uh, Father, we pray for a conviction uh, of our sin and that we would seek forgiveness when we need to. Father, we pray for the word sorry to prevail into our fam in our families and for our willingness to forgive uh, when there is honest repentance and change. And Father, for those who have today discovered uh, that you are a loving Father and want to accept your welcome home invitation, we pray that they will put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and assure them that nothing can separate them from lo the love, your love in Christ. Help them to live new lives, following Jesus, obeying your commands in all areas of life. Provide a faithful community of believers who can love and support them in their newfound faith. 
When they fail, may they seek your forgiveness. When they succeed, may they give glory to you. May they grow daily in the image of your Son. And all this we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So thank you for uh, praying with us this morning. Uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity, I think, to reflect on our families, the importance, and reflect on our relationship with our Father in heaven. Uh, we see, I see that um, since I mentioned it last time, more people have joined us on the live stream. We, uh, we w welcome Janine, uh, Sue Sherring's also there, the glasses are there, Stephen Wilson. Um, we uh, have Carol and Josh, Matt Smith, who worked last night. Sorry about that, Matt, but glad that you could make it this morning. And Carl Wong, it says that he's looking forward to seeing Tim and Naomi in person. So um, thank you for everyone who's commented. It's great to see that you're watching along. Uh, next week, we return to physical services at 8.30, 10.30 and 5pm. We will be observing COVID safety standards. We have a COVID safety plan. So uh, there will be instructions in our newsletter. So please uh, make sure that you read those instructions, things like checking in with QR codes, wearing masks, etc. We can't sing, or, however, uh, we may have uh, people leading us in song. Uh, at our 10.30 service, it will be alternating weeks because at the moment we have a restriction of one person for every four square metres. So the way that we'll be managing that is by having alternating Sunday schools. So next Sunday for the 10.30 service, we'll have our younger Sunday schools, which are pre to year two. And so we invite families who have children in those uh, uh, classes to come along. Um, if uh, you don't have children at Sunday school, then you, then you should come along. Um, and then the following week, we'll have the older Sunday school classes. And so hopefully that'll just sort of um, uh, keep our capacity, uh, keep us within the capacity requirements. Um, and so uh, if you are staying at home, you can still watch us on live stream. So perhaps for one reason or another, you can't make it next week. Uh, please watch us on live stream. Some families will come at the 10.30 service, will come next week and some will come the following week and will alternate until the restrictions are changed again to the one in two square metre rule and that we can all gather together at the 10.30 service. That's the only service that needs to change as a result of the capacity requirements. Um, but uh, 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. will also be meeting uh, as, um, as we were before. So uh, please do, uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, Jason Law will be our preacher next week. He'll be preaching from Isaiah 3 as we continue our series through Isaiah. Um, so uh, thank you. I think that's all I have to say. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Thank you to Stephen for being with us this morning and reminding us that being welcomed home by our Heavenly Father into God's family enables us to welcome each other home. Remember, as we think and reflect upon our families, that the most important relationship we have is that with our Father in heaven. And so uh, thank you for joining us together. We're now going to conclude with this song, reminding you to run to Jesus. And in this song are the words, we can always run to Jesus, Jesus strong and kind. Thank you for joining us this week. We look forward to seeing you next week.
Jesus said.